This is Capital Perspective with Senator Edward Kennedy, a forum for discussions with local community leaders to highlight local and national issues that affect the people of Massachusetts. Senator Kennedy has been committed to serving the people of Massachusetts for many years on a wide range of important issues in both foreign and domestic policy. Edward Kennedy, showcasing the achievements and successes of the people of Massachusetts. And now, Senator Edward Kennedy. During the month of February, Americans celebrate Black History Month. Schools study the history of slavery, the courageous leaders who spoke out against it, the Civil War that fought to end it, and in modern times, the battle to end school segregation, Jim Crow laws, and the poll tax. Students learn about the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King's dream and the ongoing battle against discrimination in all forms. We make progress every day in towns and cities across the country when children of all races and religions sit side by side in their classrooms, when employers hire people based on their skill, not the color of their skin. In our home state of Massachusetts, we've had a long and rich African-American history. The first Africans arrived in Boston in February 1638. They were brought as slaves, purchased in Providence Island, a Puritan colony off the coast of Central America. There were over 400 slaves in Boston by 1705, but the free black movement had already begun in Massachusetts. After the American Revolution, at the time of the first census, Massachusetts was the only state in the Union to record no slaves. The all-free African community was concerned with finding housing, educating their children, and abolishing slavery in the rest of the nation. These first grassroots campaigns began on Beacon Hill. Today, hundreds of years later, we'll hear firsthand the progress that's being made in our own backyards by some of the people who are making it happen. Larry Harris is a student at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and the CEO and the co-founder of the nonprofit organization United Leaders, which helps minority students pursue careers in public service. Hubie Jones has been a pioneer in civil rights for over 50 years and continues today to identify and eliminate barriers to progress. He's chairman of the board emeritus of Massachusetts Advocacy Center and the founder of the Boston Children's Chorus renowned for its diversity and the beautiful music they make together under Hubie's visionary leadership. Our third guest today is Marita uh, 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 Rivera, uh, chairwoman of the board of the African American Museum here in Boston. She'll talk about the attractions of the museum and the role of African American history in our future as a nation. Our fourth guest is David Harris, the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. He's an expert on civil rights, voting rights, and domestic violence. Thank you all for being here. Marita, I briefly spoke about the long African-American history in Massachusetts, and I know the African Meeting House, both in Boston and Nantucket, have an incredible story that's really interesting. Could you share some of the history of the houses and uh, what they're used for uh, today? Oh, yes. These are two of the oldest African meeting houses in the country. They're national historic sites. Uh, and they're important because the history you spoke of is often not known in the state. People don't understand there was a large free black community and that ordinary people were doing extraordinary things. Uh, we like to tell that story using the meeting houses, using a public school, the Abiel Smith School on Beacon Hill, using the black history trails, uh, because it says that all of us sitting here today have the opportunity to engage with one another uh, for positive social change. These people, free blacks, whites in Bo the Boston area came together to form the first anti-slavery societies and changed law. They made a significant uh, improvement in the country. And we think that's the kind of coalition building and the kind of activism, the kind of self-education and the kind of future building that we can still do. So these meeting houses, uh, uh, one, capture our history, but they're also launching grounds for people for current uh, events for educational activities for fun. Uh, could you tell us a bit, a little bit about the reenactment of some of the uh, yeah. events I, I, and uh, how you uh, work to help um, in the process of education, particularly with, with regard to children, that outreach program I think is yeah. really fascinating. We do a lot with, with children. Um, 
Uh, one, one thing we do is a wonderful overnight. They come and spend the night at the African Meeting House and take their flashlights and go over Beacon Hill and walk around and understand what an Underground Railroad means. They love that, so their parents always want us to have one for them. We don't think we can handle that. <laughs> but, uh, the 54th Regiment that we know from Glory uh, was recruited right on Beacon Hill at the African Meeting House. So we have uh, opportunities for reenactors to come. Uh, we have uh, programs for children when they do the kinds of activities that people were doing then, quilt making, doll making. Uh, we take them out to the Harbor Islands and to the land right around uh, Beacon Hill in Nantucket, have them go through archaeological digs. So they learn how to appreciate and uh, acquire material that speaks to them today. Could you talk a little bit about that underground railway, uh, yeah. about how uh, active that was in this uh, region? You it's know a, that an incredible story. The Beacon Hill, our, we have scholars from Smith to Mount Holyoke to UMass to Boston College, you know, on and on, who said this is the largest collection of underground railroad houses in the country, right here in Boston. So these people looked back to help those who were still enslaved, to feed them when they came to Boston, to clothe them. Uh, and the houses are part of a black history trail that starts at the Robert Gould Shaw, Shaw Memorial across from the State House covers 14 different locations, and some almost 400,000 people a year come through that trail and wind up at the meeting house and the Smith School so they can look at these buildings. Um, so we're using that, and there's a trail on Nantucket as well. So we're really using this opportunity to fill in what's often a big hole in American history that's extant right here in Boston. There are many museums that talk about these issues, but the actual artifacts are here. These houses are here on Beacon Hill in Nantucket. You mentioned uh, Glory, and uh, we oh, yeah. saw that again. It was yeah. on as one of the, I think, one of my favorite films. Mine too. And uh, uh, maybe just mention that that story is uh, just such a, a story in terms of the American Civil War. Oh yeah. And uh, right here in Boston. Right here in Boston. A wonderful plaque that's at uh, of Robert right Gould Shaw is uh, right there across from the State House. You know, so many names that we know from Bo William Lloyd Garrison uh, will have his 200th anniversary in August. 200 members of the Garrison family are gathering with the museum to talk about anti-slavery. Fred Douglas, the name we know, Charles Sumner, uh, a lawyer, you know, fought for de Senator. desegregation. <laughs> Senator. Very desegregation. good Desegregation. So many of the names okay. that we know uh, from Massachusetts, black, white, I stress that, uh, really struggling together to uh, move the Commonwealth forward and the country forward are excellent in our history. And we try to capture that because we want to encourage young people to think about their role uh, today. You mean, um, this, as Marita has given us, some of the, the real hopeful indicators in the early times of uh, the history and about the bravery and the courage, both of the individuals, the slaves that came up here and how people were, uh, were received here, and then later uh, how uh, Boston really was the place for where the abolitionist movement up, Charles Sumner, so many others, Lloyd Garrison, and uh, that uh, certainly uh, marked uh, the, uh, created so much of what was important in uh, moving us to, uh, to the time of the American Civil War. Um, tell us, it hasn't always, uh, in the wake of this, it hasn't always been easy. And uh, uh, there are people of good faith that have tried to make progress, but uh, sometimes we've slipped back. And uh, you have been such a, um, uh, an inspirational figure in terms of uh, trying to find ways of bringing people together. Tell us a little bit about um, your own, uh, how, how you got into this whole sort of movement. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we'd be interested in, you've got to save a few moments to tell us about one of the most joyous uh, uh, parts of your vision, and that is that incredible chorus that mm. those of us who have been lucky enough to, to listen to. We heard that um, a little over a year ago, I heard them, and, and uh, they are just a special treat for anybody to that's uh, coming in this uh, area region to get a chance to listen. Well, but, but tell us a little bit about your own background, how you viewed uh, Boston and some of the progress been made, that, some of the challenges that remained. Well, I came to Boston in 1955 from my native New York City to, <laughs> to, to go to the Boston University School of Social Work. And when I got here in 1955, I characterized Boston as being up south mm -hmm. because there were patterns of racial discrimination in public housing, in public education, in a whole range of institutions. 
And at that time, there was sort of quiet seething going on in Boston's black community about a whole set of grievances. And it was pretty much underground. It all came to the surface in 1963 in the middle of the National Civil Rights Movement. Uh, the NAACP went before the Boston School Committee on June 11, 1963, and, and claimed, based upon a study they had done, that de facto segregation existed in the Boston public schools. And they, and they asked for certain kinds of corrective action to be taken by the school committee. The school committee, chaired by Louise Day Hicks, said, absolutely, there is no such thing as de facto segregation. Uh, we assign kids to schools based upon where they live. Mrs. Batson, talking to, Mrs. to Ruth Batson, who recently died, the great, Batson, great, the great, very great, very great leader in the city. Mrs. Batson, uh, you know we, we have nothing to do with housing patterns in this city. Uh, we assign kids based upon where they, where they live. And your charge is absolutely baseless. There's no such thing, and we're not going to do anything. I was at that famous meeting. Uh, and from that, there came a four-month struggle that was very volatile and incredible that lasted from June until March of 1964. The school committee did not give ground. Uh, and basically, they even got greater political currency and went on to higher offices. The black community basically made the decision that uh, we're hitting our head up against a brick wall. Uh, we're not getting anywhere. We have to pursue other avenues in order to make sure our kids get a decent chance. And so METCO was formed using the state and racial imbalance law. Uh, pri uh, independent schools were formed in, in, the, in the black community, which would be like our charter schools today. Uh, there was a state experimental school using this racial imbalance law that was put, put in place. Paul Parks, another leader, played a major role in making that happen. And, and so things moved sort of uh, to try to, find other, to try to find, find other avenues. And I was, involved in, I was involved in a lot of that. The biggest thing I was involved in was that in 1969, I formed the task force on children out of school. Because when I was at the Roxbury Multi-Service Center, I had parents coming to us with kids who had been pushed out of the Boston public schools. Uh, the, the, the school saying the, school, the kids were too retarded, too emotionally disturbed, behavior problems and couldn't function in a regular classroom situation, keep them home. Illegal. Mm -hmm. It was illegal. And so we did a study. And we found out that uh, there were at least 10,000 kids uh, who were out of the Boston public schools being denied their right to an education, and it was, and it was illegal. Uh, 7,600 of those kids were Latino kids. Recently arrived in Boston, many of them who could not speak English, and there were no bilingual programs in the Boston public schools at that time. So they were just in their, in their homes and, and, in, and in the community. Uh, and uh, as a result of the, this task force report, we made an impact on then a Speaker of the House, and, uh, David Bartley, who was interested in the whole question of kids with special needs. He said, give me that report. Send me 500 copies. I'm going to send it to everybody in the legislature. <laughs> But I want you to come together with us and work on creating a special education law. And that's, that's, how, ch that's how Chapter 766 happened. The Bilingual Education Act happened. Uh, and uh, they really, uh, the, the idea of uh, educating uh, children of, of special needs uh, was really, uh, like many other ideas, really was founded here in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. And we have at the federal level what they call the IDA. But so much of those, those ideas really the, they came and sprung out from uh, the kind of... The uh, 1972 uh, special education law right. became the model for the nation right. because t two years later the nation uh, established a special education right. law and Massachusetts was the model. It was the model. We took so much of what uh, uh, was done here and that we found out that, uh, that really helped and uh, that really worked. And we. Uh, we, I might just, uh, because we want to move along quickly, we just reauthorized that. It was one of the bills that we worked with with the administration during the, uh, even the period of, of the election. Uh, the president, we came back after the election, the president signed with the omnibus bill, which is continues the funding, but the reauthorization of the IDEA. And we worked at it in a bipartisan way, and uh, I think it was one of the little encouraging aspects of the, this kind of a, a, a part. 
Well, I would, I'm interested in Dave uh, Harris. Is the now we've got the somewhat of the early history, some of of the struggle. Mm -hmm. You are certainly a part. We had uh, the at, at the national level, we passed a number of pieces of legislation, the 64 Act, the public accommodations. When you were talking about the early 60s, I remember going to the early 60s where a number of the younger people here went south and sat in the lunch counters. Mm -hmm. and remember the uh, uh, Dr. King, of course, who had gone to the Divinity School uh, here at, at Boston University and the inspiration that he had had in so many of the young people. And we passed the 64 Act, Public 65 Act, the Voting Rights Act, Housing Act of 68, which really wasn't nearly as strong enough, uh, which we eventually were able to pass in 1988. But, um, and the, during that period, they set up the Lawyers Committee. And tell us a little bit about uh, this and how uh, I'm enormously interested about what the, the current challenges are in, and, uh, and what you're doing, we're able to do about some of these challenges. Right. Thank you. Um, of course, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights was... Tell us just a little bit about yourself. Originally, I'm from North Carolina. Yeah. I grew up um, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, um, doing much of what was still the leftovers of the Jim Crow era. And I learned a, a lot about what was going on from personal experience as well as what my parents taught me and told me about what was going on and experienced a lot of it firsthand. Thurgood Marshall very quickly became my idol and that was the reason why I decided to become a lawyer. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights was originally an idea uh, brought about by President Kennedy in 1963. Uh, the number of statutes that you just mentioned were uh, being devised at the time, but the President Kennedy and Attorney General Kennedy knew that those laws would not be effective if lawyers were not in place to um, seek enforcement in the courts. With that reality in mind, he met with, President Kennedy met with some 250 lawyers from across the country, and from that meeting in June of 63, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights was founded. The Boston um, branch of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, uh, of course, has been involved uh, ever since 1968. The litigation to desegregate the schools in Boston, of course, um, was one that we brought along with a uh, local law firm, Foley Hoag. Um, and of course, in other areas of education, the litigation in the early 90s, dealing with equalized funding of public schools, the McDuffie case, that was, that was a lawyer's committee case as well. Um, desegregation of public housing was not just by way of statute, but by way of litigation, again brought by the lawyer's committee. Today's challenge, great example. Um, or an unfortunate example, this coming Monday um, before the First Circuit, the Lynn School Voluntary Desegregation Plan is under attack and the First Circuit is going to hear, an, is going to rehear a case, um, a lower de decision in which the um, First Circuit, a lower panel of the First Circuit decided that plan was not legal. Efforts towards affirmative action um, equal access to education continue to be attacked. This backlash continues. Uh, recently, Boston was brought, um, was released from a consent decree requirement to hire certain numbers of African Americans to their police force as well as their fire department. Uh, the struggles continue, but the Lawyers Committee continues to fight those this fights. This is uh, extraordinary because when President Kennedy asked in 63 that what, we're not going to be able to get all the lawyers. The Justice Department isn't going to be able. We want to get volunteers uh, law, and the major law firms. It was one of those times where people had really echoed when President Kennedy said, we ask what you could do for your country, not your country could do for you. And lawyers and law firms like, from all over the country came together in a, in a volunteer way to try and make sure that uh, the, the laws were going to be sort of implemented and, and followed through. And this is still going and, and uh, continuing uh, uh, going on. You, you mentioned about the quality of funding on education, too. You just went by that. One of the, the most wonderful parts of our Massachusetts Constitution are those words that John Adams wrote in there, talking about the importance of education and uh, education being available to all. And when he said all, he meant all. And 
that provision was replicated in every state constitution in the country, none as clear as our Massachusetts constitution. And what you're trying to say is when they say all that we mean funding so that we're not going to have the enormous disparities in children. Money isn't the answer to everything, but it, it, it does mean, in many cases, getting smaller class sizes, better trained teachers, supplementary services, which uh, children uh, need, some in the earlier education as well. But it still marches on. I want to just ask you, uh, before uh, we hear from uh, Larry here uh, about some of the future, just a little bit about uh, the, the voting cases that are still out there. Just can you tell us uh, quickly about where we are sort of on, on some of those uh, issues that I know that you were involved in this last, last election. And then I want to hear about our future uh, with Larry <laughs> over here. And he's, he's chomping and ready to go. So uh, tell us just a little bit about it. Uh, well, of course, we won a major redistricting lawsuit early last year involving uh, state house lines um, in Massachusetts, particularly within Boston. But in addition to that, the Lawyers Committee, as well as a number of national and local organizations uh, across the country, and including Massachusetts, organized some 8,000 lawyers and 22,000 volunteers in 22 states, uh, what we call the Election Protection Coalition. It provided, um, on election day and the early voting periods, um, on-the-spot assistance and intervention on behalf of voters who have being deceived by various dirty tricks and harassment. Suppression, what they suppression. call it voter suppression. And voter suppression all over the country, including misinformation flyers and everything when that's dates, going on. The dates of voting, flyers yes. put out, make sure you vote Wednesday, you know, that's not right. Tuesday, and yeah. all of the other kinds of activity. And that's still going, that's still a, pr a Still challenge. going on, well, still going on. And we not only provided the assistance, but we were able to document the problems so the next step is to approach Congress and, of course, the state houses, including mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, for further election reform. That brings us, uh, Larry, to, you've got a very exciting, innovative uh, program that you're doing with young leaders. And can you tell us a little bit about it? We've got a little <coughs> bit of the past, our struggle, some of the things that are necessary to keep on going. And you're our future here. And I'd like to uh, wonder if you could share a little bit about what the organization is and how, where the idea came from and sure, sure. how are you going? Well, Senator, I'm from Washington, D.C. I, I think I have politics kind of woven in my fabric. Um, uh, President Kennedy once said D.C. is a city of northern charm and southern efficiency, but that's not why I left. <laughs> they just got better football here in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, I, I actually um, came up with the idea for United Leaders with four of my uh, good friends from college. Uh, we, we were in a dorm room at Tufts University thinking about you know, what are the issues amongst you know, in our generation that are really going to get people excited about political action as you see on every college campus, about 85% of the students do some form of community service and only about 10 or 15% do any form of uh, political service. And that was, a, that was in a study by the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. Um, and, and what we really tried to do was tap into the idealism of a generation. Here in Boston, um, we are able to see historically all the innovation that's happened, not only in civil rights, but amongst uh, the many great movements in the country. And, and one of the, the next movement that needs to happen is transitioning young people from the service movement into political service. We've got some of the greatest nonprofits in the world here with young people that are so excited to go serve their country. I think they'd also be uh, excited about serving their country in another way, which is through politics and taking policy by the bullhorns and really thinking about how they can uh, change the world through uh, political action. So uh, is, is one of the real problems that we hear uh, a good deal about is that when young people sort of get out of the college, they, uh, because they've uh, had to borrow, they've got a, a debt out there. Yes. And if they want to try and do something in the nonprofit area, or if they want to go work and try and state government, or they even in the federal government, some of the agencies are beginning to look at it. Uh, they, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult for them to be able to take advantage of some of the opportunities that might be available to, to others. And, Absolutely. And, and uh, there, there's some built-in kinds of um, uh, deterrence, are there not? And that we, they've, got to get, they've got to get on through. Yes, um, when, I, when, we, when we graduated from college, uh, you know, we were not students of means. We graduated just with passion and, and idealism about starting a, an organization. And we realized that one of the major hurdles to being in politics or in the, in the public sector in general was just the financial uh, kind of uh, roadblocks that are put in front of young people. And we graduated with you know, a tremendous amount of debt and you know, trying to think of how can we make this financially feasible for us to really pursue something we're passionate about. And luckily, we held out. Uh, I think what, what we've found 
overwhelmingly is people that have committed to service, whether it be through City Year or Teach for yeah, America, et cetera. Exactly. They just have that, they, they, they wake up every day determined to change the world and have a good time, and it's easy to plan your day when, when you're doing something like a City Year. That's good. Uh, tell me a little bit about, can, are you working on sort of other campuses or other, uh, in other locations as well? I absolutely, mean, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We've got young people all over the country. Um, right now we're focusing on Boston, the greater Boston area and schools in Massachusetts. So we're working on college campuses with uh, great young people from Harvard to Tufts to uh, uh, some of the schools right here in the middle of Boston, Emerson. We're, we're doing some recruiting um, over at University of Boston, uh, UMass Boston and, and really trying to find uh, great idealistic young people who you know really have have taken the opportunity to see kind of what are the problems going on around them and what do they care about and how can they get involved and United Leaders has been open for about five years now so we've also done work in San Francisco and Washington DC and we're hoping to expand the network we're gonna find a generation of young people who really want to put politics above self-interest and raise the level of polit political discourse and connect the nation back to government sounds, sounds pretty good to me <laughs> this is this is one of the things that uh, that you uh, guy <laughs> He's, um, I can tell, an inspiring, inspiring uh, uh, figure on, on that. But this is one of the things, I think, the challenges that we find. Young people will get into uh, uh, volunteerism, but uh, there are not as many as getting into, uh, into politics. And Lord only knows we need them. Uh, there's, uh, and there's uh, a number, I think, uh, that are going in the legislature now. They're uh, certainly in the Congress, the expansion. Um, uh, there's uh, been a, an important expansion in the Black Caucus, Hispanic Caucus, also women uh, in, uh, in, in, in politics as, as well. They, we still don't, we're still well, well behind, obviously, in the Senate and the House, but there's uh, increasing activity at the at, uh, at local level and, and, uh, and the rest. Well, this is enormously uh, interesting. Well, Marita, maybe just we, we just have a minute or two left, um, and I think it would be for those around the state um, they come to Boston. Uh, I, I think you might want to say a word that, uh, and want to bring their children or their families. Oh, yeah. That um, the, the meeting house is interesting, it's and interesting. they can get get started. And uh, from that, mm -hmm. uh, they can learn some of these other about some of these other programs. They can. It's one of the ten most visited museums in Boston. Boston right. Business Journal. It's worth coming. That's worth good. coming for That's coming to see. Good. And uh, UB, you certainly can use, uh, tell us about the, quickly about the children's chorus. We have only got a minute or so left, but we got to hear that. About well, that. Boston Children's Chorus, we bring together young people from the suburbs and from urban neighborhoods, uh, diversity in terms of race, ethnicity, and social class, to learn to sing at a level of high artistic excellence, but also to learn to, to, to come together, uh, thrive together, and be ambassadors for the city by singing at major public events and private events. We also are planning to use this chorus as an instrument for social change in the city. We will use it as a way to have major events. One of our plans is, is to have a major community sing that brings people together from churches, uh, social groups, singing together in the Boston Common uh, as a way to break down, break down uh, walls that separate us in terms of social isolation. And we have a whole set of other ideas as well. Well, there you go. The, and I can just tell you that the, uh, I have heard them and li listened to them, and they are inspiring, uplifting, and uh, just magnificent. So Thanks. congratulations you. Uh, to you for that very, very good, uh, good work. Um, I can't thank uh, all of you enough for, for being here today and for sharing all your experience, insight, and knowledge. Uh, You've each made an outstanding contribution to civil rights and to the public service in Massachusetts uh, and the nation. It's very much an ongoing battle, and we're proud of the progress we've made, but we know we have more to do. We're fortunate to have leaders like uh, each of you to, to get it done. We thank you very much for joining us on this program. <laughs>